Welcome uh, everyone to this evening's current legal problems lecture, uh, one that certainly meets our aims of covering current and topical issues. My name is uh, Sylvia Chateau. I'm a lecturer in public law here at UCL Laws and one of the editors of the lecture series and the related journal. It is my pleasure to not just welcome you tonight, but also to invite my colleague and your friend, Professor Rona McRae, who is Professor of Constitutional and European uh, Law at UCL Laws. He will be uh, chairing our lecture tonight, as well as the Q&A. So without further ado, Ronan, the floor is yours. Take us away. Hello, everybody. Thank you, Sylvia. Thanks for coming. Um, so, you know, yes, I'm here partly because I am a professor of European law at UCL, partly because I'm one of the staff members who can pronounce the surname of our guest. And, um, you know, uh, until 1973, until Ireland joined the European Economic Community, uh, women were banned from the Irish Civil Service, married women were banned from the Irish Civil Service and were fired upon marriage. And EU changed, EU membership changed that. And it was part of a wider change of the role of Irish women that EU brought about in, in Irish society. And I don't know if that's the reason, but of the kind of great Irish legal minds, a disproportionate number have been women who dedicated their professional lives to the study of the European Union. Uh, we have Shifra O'Leary, uh, Gronia de Burka, Deirdre Curtin, uh, the first female judge of the European Court of Justice, Fidel Mamakin. And tonight's guest is a Great, uh, worthy continuer of this tradition. Um, professor Niamh Nikwivna is Professor of European Union Law at Edinburgh University. She is the joint editor of the Common Market Law Review, a post she also that previously exercise, exercised for the European Law Review. She's published in every major EU law academic journal. Uh, her work focuses on um, substantive EU law from a constitutional perspective. Uh, particularly, she looks at free movement law and our principles of fairness, integrity, coherence, and the ro uh, role of judiciary, uh, how, how it looks at free movement through those, uh, in the light of those principles. She recently completed a major, a uh, leave review, major research fellowship, looking at how the foundational commitment to equal treatment in EU law has become de um, detached from how free movement is experienced in person. We are very honoured to have her here tonight to hear her talk, which is not on free movement law, but on how Brexit has, uh, whether Brexit has changed EU law. It's my honour to turn over the floor to Professor Niamh McWhibne. Thank you very much, Ronan, uh, for your very kind introduction and your beautiful pronunciation as well uh, of my difficult name. And thank you to Sylvia and her colleagues on Current Legal Problems for inviting me to deliver this lecture. Um, it's a real honour to be able to speak with you this evening. I'm just sorry we can't be there in person, but delighted to be able to meet you in this way. In February 2016, the UK and EU27 governments agreed, among other measures, to amend EU legislation to produce two reforms to the free movement of workers in the event that the referendum in the UK would lead to a Remain result. First, a safeguard mechanism introducing restrictions on in-work benefits for newly arriving EU workers. And second, in the context of new claims made by EU workers, the option to index exported child benefits to the conditions of the member state where the child resides. In January 2019, the European Commissioner for Employment, Social Affairs, Skills and Labour Mobility issued these remarks in language far more familiar to EU lawyers. This press release marked the commencement of infringement proceedings against Austria. Why? Because Austria had introduced international law an adjustment mechanism indexing family benefits and family tax reductions for EU nationals working in Austria when their children reside abroad. In other words, introducing a measure that would have come into effect for the entire European Union had the outcome of the UK referendum been different. By pursuing this action against Austria, 
which is now pending before the Court of Justice. It might be argued that for the Commission, the core principles and functioning of EU law are now back to normal, following the extraordinary circumstances both preceding and then produced by the UK's withdrawal from the European Union. But can EU law just go back? Or did Brexit change fundamental premises of EU law in ways that will continue to shape relations between the remaining states with the Union and with each other, as well as between the Union and the wider world? That is the question that I want to examine in this lecture. In the first part of the lecture, I will briefly signal some of the ways in which Brexit necessarily expanded or grew EU law. In other words, how it changed EU law in what we might call a literal sense. I will then explore two examples in more detail to illustrate suggestions of deeper changes to the EU legal framework. First, an internal example tracing how the idea of an orderly withdrawal from the Union emerged and then took harder legal shape over the course of the withdrawal negotiations. Second, an external example that demonstrates shifting perspectives on the role of mutual trust beyond the boundaries of European Union membership. In the final part of the lecture, I will bring together and reflect on the main implications that I aim to draw from these examples to argue that Brexit did change EU law in some significant respects, not only in terms of developing the substance of EU law, but also, and perhaps more profoundly, in terms of how EU law is made. First, to address growing EU law. And we were just talking about this earlier, but this is actually another anniversary. It's the last photograph that I took outside of uh, Scotland uh, before the lockdown in March 2020. And some of you may recognise that this uh, wonderful tree grows in the garden of the law department at the Euro European University Institute. So to consider the growing of EU law through the Brexit process. First, Obviously, but still importantly, the events of Brexit have grown what Christophe Ilion refers to as union membership law. It has added significant substance to the terse blueprint provided by Article 50 of the Treaty on European Union for the process of withdrawing from the Union. And this complements the dimensions of union membership law that govern accession to the Union under Article 49 of the same treaty. For example, and acknowledging that the answer is not provided by the wording of Article 50 alone, the Court of Justice confirmed in its Whiteman ruling that a member state's notification of its intention to withdraw from the Union is revocable, for as long as a withdrawal agreement concluded between that member state and the European Union has not entered into force, or if no such agreement has been concluded for as long as the two-year period laid down in Article 50, Paragraph 3, has not expired. Second, the concepts, procedures and hugely complex institutional architecture created to support both the withdrawal agreement and the trade and cooperation agreement negotiated with the UK, provide another example of legal expansion with which we will all have to grapple over the months and years ahead. I would also suggest that managing the process of Brexit has advanced dimensions of EU law more generally in two main ways. First, it revived points of EU law that had been somewhat dormant. For example, through the Brexit negotiations, the significance of the autonomy of union decision making in a general sense came to the fore, rebalancing, perhaps, the previously prevailing dominance of the role of the Court of Justice in the autonomy context. 
Second, I think that the Brexit process has provided novel and often clearer language through which the nature of the EU legal order is more effectively articulated. Perhaps most strikingly, through the Commission's idea that union policies and actions form a unique ecosystem, which is underpinned by instruments and structures that cannot be separated from each other. This idea of an ecosystem communicates the interdependency of union policies and the union system. And in turn, this emphasizes the significance of being a part or not being a part of that system. The ecosystem idea reminds us too that the enforcement mechanisms on which union policies depend are not just about centralizing power for its own sake. They are in fact what make the union's policies so powerfully functional. The concept of the indivisibility of the EU single market provides another, though perhaps more controversial example of the same point about clearer articulation of principles of EU law. Whether you consider that the single market's indivisibility was conjured especially for Brexit, or just articulated more explicitly a principle of EU law already functioning implicitly, perhaps depends on whether you consider indivisibility to constitute a state of being so that the market is either indivisible or not, or instead you consider it as a legal principle that can, like other legal principles, be limited in proportionate ways and for defensible public interest reasons. It should also be acknowledged that there was perhaps less growth of EU law in some areas than had been argued or hoped for. And perhaps the best example of this concerns the sphere of citizens' rights. Notwithstanding the fundamental quality of union citizenship affirmed over many years in the case law of the Court of Justice, in this field, the primacy of the connection between member state nationality and union citizenship was ultimately upheld. Notwithstanding arguments that a true form of union citizenship might have been expected to sustain more enduring protection, for example, of future free movement rights for British nationals, irrespective of what might or might not be agreed as part of the framework of the future EU-UK relationship. So while the growth of EU law is evident in many different respects, I am interested for the purposes of this lecture in exploring changes to EU law that are at once both more subtle and more systemic. In the first of two examples used to illustrate this quality of change, I will trace the birth of a legal principle, the concept we are all familiar with now of an orderly withdrawal from the European Union. And I will also reflect on the consequences that creating the orderly withdrawal principle has produced. This statement from Donald Tusk, at the time the President of the European Council, was issued just one day after the referendum in the UK and just after the outcome of the referendum had become clear. I think we can see here that there is understandable emotion alongside an appeal for a measured response. And there is some humility too, in the sense of the suggestion that wider lessons still had to be learned for the union itself. But even on such a difficult day, President Tusk sets seeds here that would come to shape the negotiations that followed in critical and defining ways. He refers to the unity of the EU27 and to the European Union as the framework 
for their common future. But of particular significance for present purposes, notice how he frames Brexit as a legal process by underlining that there will be no legal vacuum. And he also recalls that the procedures for withdrawal are, in his view, clear and set out in the treaties. Just four days later, the European Council, including then Prime Minister David Cameron, issued a brief statement after its meeting, referring to the meeting's focus on the political consequences of the UK referendum. But contrast this, Donald Tusk's statement the following day after a meeting of the EU27. There is renewed recognition here that a wider process of political reflection should be progressed. But already we can see evidence of crucial decisions that have had enduring effect over the whole negotiation process, including the fact that Britain's withdrawal from the European Union must be orderly. These determinations then find expression in more formal language in the statement issued on behalf of the EU27 after the same meeting on the 29th of June. And their significance is sustained in the European Council's guidelines published almost 10 months later in April 2017. Notice also here that the European Council declared it would remain permanently seized of the negotiations and that it would update its guidelines as necessary. Further underlining its stewardship of the process of the withdrawal the European Council goes on to articulate what it calls core principles. These core principles would govern the entirety of the negotiations and they stem from the need to ensure an orderly withdrawal. They also connect back to systemic premises of EU law, such as the principle of autonomy. Both the framing and the functioning of the withdrawal process, as established by the European Council, are then confirmed in the Council's negotiating directives adopted one month later, and also explicitly including here acceptance that the European Council's guidelines might evolve. The principle of an orderly withdrawal is then legally hardened in two key ways. First, it found its way into the legal reasoning of the Court of Justice in the Whiteman ruling, delivered in December 2018. As you can see here, the Court confirms that Article 50 of the TEU pursues two objectives, the second of which is to establish a procedure to enable a withdrawal to take place in an orderly fashion. Second, the objective of orderly withdrawal also finds reflection as the objective of the entire withdrawal agreement according to its own preamble, as well as for the separate arrangements put in place through the protocols for Northern Ireland, Gibraltar and the sovereign base areas, areas in Cyprus. But perhaps the transition period in place for most of 2020 was the most remarkable product of the orderly withdrawal principle. What the European Council referred to as a time-limited prolongation of the Union acquis was deemed possible for the Council on the basis proposed by the Commission, that Article 50 of the TEU confers on the Union an exceptional 
horizontal competence to cover in the withdrawal agreement all matters necessary to arrange the withdrawal. The extent to which the UK, by then a third state, would be treated as if it were still a union member state was plainly acknowledged as these extracts from the Council's January 2018 supplementary directives make clear. And the initiation of infringement proceedings against the UK in October 2020, in the very final weeks of the transition period, on the basis of proposed provisions of the Internal Market Bill that were later withdrawn, starkly demonstrated the uniqueness of this period of membership, non-membership overlap, which in turn provides a bridge to the second example that I want to sketch here, which concerns how the Union conceives of relationships with third states and how it articulates these relationships through the register of legal concepts. I've already mentioned the Court of Justice's ruling in Whiteman, and it is a useful reference point here too, in the sense that it brings together decades of constitutionally formative rulings and opinions of the court to express the coordinates of the autonomous union legal order. An important feature of which concerns reflecting the Commission's idea of the ecosystem a structured network of principles, rules, and mutually interdependent legal relations, which bind the European Union and its member states reciprocally, as well as binding its member states to each other. As the court has stated in the LM ruling, this interdependency is forged around a shared commitment to the common values on which the Union is founded, which in turn implies and justifies the existence of mutual trust between the Member States, that those values will be recognised and therefore that the EU law that implements them will be respected. The particular significance of mutual trust for the Union's area without internal frontiers, in a general sense, is then emphasised. As is the principle's fundamental grounding of the European arrest warrant mechanism, more specifically. The crucial implication for present purposes is that it seemed that a legal order both underpinned by but also generating mutual trust between its members could only function through that legal bond of membership. Joining that idea together with the area of freedom, security and justice of the European Union. In a line of case law on the intersection between Union citizenship and extradition to third states, the Court of Justice ruled that member states were obliged first to consider whether the European arrest warrant mechanism could be exploited in order to ensure that situations in which a union citizen faced criminal charges or detention following conviction could be managed within the territory of the union. This would mean surrender of the citizen to their home state before extradition to a requesting third state would be progressed. And yet, in the extraordinary RO judgment delivered in September 2018, so this means during the Brexit negotiation phase, but before the UK had formally withdrawn from the Union, the Court of Justice seemed to abandon decades of its own case law to find ways to overcome the referring Irish court's unease, or at least uncertainty, about surrendering a union citizen to the UK on the basis of a European arrest warrant, since the period of detention in the UK would outlast 
the UK's membership of the European Union. First, the court placed emphasis on the UK's membership of the ECHR for the purposes of shared standards of fundamental rights protection, since it observed that Article 3 of the ECHR corresponds to Article 4 of the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights. While Advocate General Spunar acknowledged in his opinion for the case that the UK had decided to withdraw from the EU, not to abandon the rule of law or protection of fundamental rights, he also asked to be, in his words, forgiven for adding that, as recently as 2016, the then UK Home Secretary had pleaded for the UK to leave the ECHR. The then Home Secretary being, at the time of the RO judgment, Prime Minister Theresa May. Second, the court extended extraordinary faith to guarantees contained in national law in the UK, even though subsequent changes to national law could be neither predicted nor prevented. Third, the court also downplayed the absence of the preliminary reference mechanism in the functioning of any anticipated surrender agreement between the Union and the UK, reasoning in striking contrast to the parallel emphasis placed on the same preliminary ruling mechanism in case law on the European arrest warrant, mutual trust and the protection of shared union values, including in its rule of law jurisprudence, which was developing and deepening at the same time. So I think that the RO ruling is perhaps best understood, if not excused, as a judgment delivered at a time of intense political sensitivity and uncertainty. As can be seen here in the court's opinion on the free trade agreement negotiated with Canada, CETA, and delivered in April 2019, the more conventional assumption was that mutual trust constitutes a material point of difference between being a member and not being a member of the European Union. Article 3, paragraph 5 of the TEU indicates that the Union should promote its values in its relations with the wider world. And Article 21 recognises that third states might share those values. Article 8 commits the Union to developing a special relationship with its neighbouring countries. Nevertheless, the specific characteristics of the EU legal order and the interdependency both enabled and reinforced through mutual trust seemed to have legal significance in the context of Union membership alone. And so, this remark from the opinion of Advocate General Tanshev in the recent IN case might not seem too surprising. In the context of questions referred, in order to understand whether the presumption in favour of utilising the European arrest warrant mechanism over extradition to a third state, which as I mentioned had developed up to that point in case law only concerning Union citizens, should be extended to Icelandic nationals in light of the agreement on surrender concluded between the EU, Iceland and Norway. The very different response provided by the Court of Justice in contrast to this view from Advocate General Tanshev is absolutely remarkable. The Court highlights the criteria of proximity, long-standing common values and European identity from the preamble to the EEA agreement to underline the special relationship between the European Union, its member states and the EFTA states. The court then joins EFTA state nationality, the EEA agreement and Iceland's application of the Schengen Acquis to find the position of an Icelandic national 
to be objectively comparable with that of an EU citizen, enabling in consequence application of the union citizenship based arrest warrant case law by analogy. What conclusions and implications can be drawn from these two examples of changed EU law, bringing together both the internal and external dimensions of the EU's legal order? In editorial comments published in the Common Market Law Review in 2014, reflecting at the time on responses to the Eurozone crisis and the Court of Justice's light touch scrutiny of them in its Pringle ruling, it was observed that we are now experiencing the development of a set of relations that deal with the objectives or the values of the Union and yet seek to distance themselves from the Union's common framework. It was further argued that a basic principle in the EU is that membership of the Union should always prevail over the reciprocal relations between the Member States and that the Member States cannot rely on their sovereign power to evade constraints laid down in the treaties. The editorial also cautioned that the decrease in trust and harmony in a context of increased economic and political interdependence might explain the development of both cooperation and disputes between member states at what it called the margins of the EU framework. What is notable for me about the management of the Brexit process on the EU side is, in contrast to the EU's management of the Eurozone crisis, a more persistent recourse to both the fundamentals of EU law and the integrity of the EU's institutional system. In some ways, the unity of the EU27 found expression through recourse to the common framework that the Union provided through legal instruments and processes. And yet, managing the process of Brexit has amplified but also changed some of these systemic dimensions of EU law. It has changed what Maurice Cremona conceptualises as structural principles of EU law. The principles that, for Loe Kazulai, contributing to that project, make the union and union law more resilient. From the internal example of the orderly withdrawal, I am not challenging the usefulness or the importance of the very idea of an orderly withdrawal. And I am not in any way preferring a disorderly withdrawal. But agreeing with the logic or even necessity of something is not sufficient to ensure its legality. It is critical that we interrogate first how this objective was conceived. Second, how it was so rapidly and so smoothly absorbed as the principal guiding objective for the entire Article 50 process. And third, most importantly, the consequences attributed to and justified through recourse to it. What an, <clears throat> excuse me, what an orderly withdrawal actually entailed was rarely questioned, which in turn led, led to the packaging of some extraordinary political choices through the expedient language of law. It remains to be seen whether the core principles articulated by the European Council will have legal life beyond Brexit, whether they are helpful or unhelpful in terms of EU external relations more generally or the extent to which they communicate more stridently or change what it means to be in a legal sense and therefore also not to be an EU member state. The central question is this, can law made for the purposes of Brexit be easily unmade? Writing in the 2018 Brexit special issue of the Common Market Law Review, Elion suggested that the European Council's core principles, and I quote, arguably have significance beyond the context of withdrawal. 
Importantly, he phrased it in this way, that the European Council has forcefully reaffirmed and or articulated what its members see as principles underpinning European integration. This language for me is crucial, where Elion recognizes instances of both reaffirming and articulation of principles of law. So we have amplification, but we also have creation. And this in turn connects to a crucial question raised by Katie Sowery in the European Law Review. Which institution, she asks, is responsible for identifying and upholding values that purportedly enjoy an elevated status? She discusses this principally, but not exclusively, through the example of the Eurozone crisis. And she uses the term informal mechanisms of primary law change. This is a wonderful image, informal mechanisms of changing the highest level of EU law. Brexit has underscored the need for us to confront these anomalies. In 2017, your UCL colleague, Pete Eckhout, writing with Eleni Francu, issued a compelling appeal for a constitutionalist reading of all aspects of the Article 50 process to ensure compliance with EU constitutional law. I am not convinced that we have yet sufficiently probed or challenged the relative absence of deep questioning of the transition arrangements, for example, more specifically of the stretching of Article 50 to provide an exceptional legal basis for them on the justification of ensuring an orderly withdrawal. Moreover, while the transition period lasted in the end for 11 months, it could have persisted for a further two years. Michael Dugan did raise doubts, commenting that a transitional plan, which is based on the direct and even wholesale, even if only temporary, extension of the union legal order to the territory of a third country represents a highly expansive and truly exceptional conception of the competences conferred by Article 50 TEU. Such a conception, he suggested, is not only difficult to square with the explicit text of Article 50, it could also sit uneasily with myriad other provisions of EU law. For some, the enhanced role of the European Council and its purpose in articulating core principles that have functioned as premises of EU primary law might be perceived to provide a useful and even welcome counterbalance to the dominance of judicial constitutional development in the European Union. But does this role for the European Council sit easily with Article 15 of the TEU, which says that the European Council shall not exercise legislative functions. If a critical part of the function of law is to place boundaries around objectives, then it turns out that there was plenty of law to be found in the deceptively named guidelines produced by the European Council for Brexit. Additionally, and linking here back to the issues raised in connection with the Eurozone crisis, it is important to reflect carefully on the increasingly blurred lines between when it is the European Council that is acting and when it is representatives of the member states acting outside of that institutional configuration. We also need to be clear about the criteria that determine that distinction. There is a real risk of selective institutional or non-institutional convening which is having repercussions across many areas of EU law and policy at present, from statements agreed in connection with migration policy, to the allocation conditions for COVID funding, to appointments and removals from the Court of Justice. From the external example, there is an undoubted complexity emerging in EU law that transcends the often too blunt and generic concept of the third state. In many respects, this is a welcome complexity. A better recognition that the criteria of proximity 
long-standing common values and European identity that frame the EEA agreement have broader resonance and that relations with third states have produced an intricate matrix of legal concepts and legal consequences. Moreover, Brexit's reminder that not all of the close outside third states aspire to union membership might be stark, but it is also the reality. However, as the rulings in both RO and IN have demonstrated, the components of EU primary law that can in fact be shared, that are or are not shareable with close outside third states, have not yet been systematically clarified. And once again, the reverberations of positions either articulated or entirely created for the purposes of Brexit are not yet known. Ongoing negotiations with Switzerland, for example, will be crucial in this respect. In their forthcoming annotation of the IN ruling, Fredriksen and Ilion suggest that the court may even have created a new fundamental status in EU law. Not the fundamental status of union citizenship, which is inherently linked to member state nationality, but a fundamental status specifically conceived in the context of EEA relations, premised on extending the internal market in the most complete way possible. Yet Fredrickson and Ilion also point out that it is not clear from the judgment whether Schengen and or the Iceland-Norway surrender agreement were equally important components in the court's reasoning. And as an aside, it might be noted that in the 1,449 pages of the trade and cooperation agreement between the EU and the UK, there is just one mention of mutual trust, not in connection with the provisions on surrender, but to building mutual trust to, through the sharing of information on technical barriers to trade and market surveillance. At the same time, the EU can articulate its own understanding of the legal premises of its external relationships all at once. It matters ultimately how this understanding is received across the increasingly varied patterns of its relations with the wider world. Heivi Lino and Lisa Lepavirta reach somewhat bleak conclusions on the potential for cooperation between states outside of the framework of EU law. They concluded first, as they put it, that if you wish to play with EU states, you need to comply with EU rules, irrespective of whether or not you're an EU member yourself. Second, they argue that the chances of making your voice heard in EU negotiations are slim if you are not an EU member state. Will the arrangements agreed between the EU and the UK in place already, and inevitably in some respects still to evolve, make this EU-centric way of doing things sustainable. The full scale and scope of changes to EU law at a systemic level realised through the process of the UK's withdrawal from the Union will only emerge through the extent to which they are replicated or reversed beyond the specific case of Brexit. In that sense, the credibility of how Brexit was framed on the EU side as a process of law will be tested. There are positive signs of wider institutional sharing in, ownership of and responsibility for expressing and progressing the ecosystem of the EU legal order. There is more alertness and openness to the complexity of EU law in both an internal and external sense. But greater clarity about different dimensions of that complexity is needed. Restoring meaningful processes of scrutiny is essential. The rushed acceptance of the withdrawal agreement in its very final stages and the trade and cooperation agreement even more so did not project the EU institutional system in a positive light. I have not addressed the role of the European Parliament in this lecture purely for reasons of time, but the speed at which it is expected to assess and give consent for the trade and cooperation agreement at the moment is disturbing. Neither can we afford to look past the challenges that the European Union faces within as well as beyond its own borders. If a commitment to shared values is what gels the whole Union ecosystem together, 
then a commitment to protecting and securing these values matters too. Legal principles, though, will only go so far. Eleanor Sharpstone's remark in the course of delivering the 2020 Hamlin Lectures that law cannot create the soul of Europe resonates profoundly. That work is up to all of us. Yet there is, notwithstanding the shock of Brexit, a maturing of the fundamental principles of the EU system and of the EU ambition of solidarity, not just the legal bonds on which the Union is based. In the 2016 new settlement decision, which again never took effect because of the outcome of the referendum, an expression of more limited political commitment to further European integration specific to the UK, linked in many respects to the concept of the ever closer union of the peoples of Europe, was not just acknowledged or, concede or conceded, but intended to be reflected in a future revision of the treaties. I am not sure that such a concession would be possible now, ironically, because of the EU unity and agreement that manifested through the Brexit process. Before Brexit, the Court of Justice referred to the ever closer union concept in its case law mainly on access to documents, reflecting the fact that the rest of that statement in the treaty refers to decisions being taken as closely as possible to the citizen in accordance with the principle of subsidiarity. But in Whiteman, which I now think of not as a Brexit case, but a fundamental EU legal order case, the court expressly invokes creation of an ever closer union among the peoples of Europe as the very purpose of the treaties. Building on the idea in opinion 191, that the objective of the treaties is to make concrete progress towards European unity and thereby producing a symmetry of constitutional exposition across the decades. But perhaps without the shrillness attributed to similar statements made in opinion 213 on accession to the ECHR, characterized in that context at the time as rigidity, arrogance, selfishness, or even fearfulness. How the complexity of integration, internally as well as externally, can be progressed remains a critical challenge for the years ahead. At one level, perhaps Brexit has crystallised that there must be a core commitment, that compromises can be made and differences not just tolerated but actively supported only beyond that agreed core. What, makes Brexit, what Brexit makes more complex is that this shared core connects to the idea of the ecosystem, not the union's values or its structural legal principles or its policies in isolation, but some kind of stable yet evolving compound with elements of all of these dimensions, tied closely to where in institutional terms decisions are made and to how adhering to them is enforced. Puzzlingly, this knotty understanding of the union ecosystem acquired for me both density and elusiveness through the process of Brexit. One final question to conclude. Does Brexit leave imprints that might prove more difficult to transcend? This statement in the court's ruling in Tarola about balancing freedom of movement for workers with ensuring that the social security systems of member states are not placed under unreasonable burden a test more usually seen in case law on EU citizens who are not working or self-employed came after Brexit. The pending case against Austria on equal treatment obligations with which I opened the lecture will be pivotal in this respect. And on the point of unequal treatment of workers, I hope that the Court of Justice will leave Brexit behind on this issue at least. Thank you. Thank you very much, Niamh. Uh, that was a fantastic talk. Um, really thoughtful, original, rigorous, insightful, and I think with the best academic discussions, um, you give a sense of, there is a general sense that you might have about disparate events that you brought together and gave a sense to, and uh, in a really insightful way. So thank you very much. Um, 
I have loads of questions myself, but I don't want to put in. We have one question to start with. Please, uh, others, feel free to come in. We have a few minutes. Um, the first question is from uh, Fergus Randolph QC, and I think it relates part of to you. you. You spoke about how the European Council, the role of the European Council, and how uh, it's prohibition on acting as a legislative body, but then there's a lot of confusion about, at times, whether the European Council is acting as the European Council or as a collection of member states outside the scope of the treaty. And the question relates, I think, to that, as we know, um, it's, it's the question is about the dismissal of Advocate General Sharpstrom from the Court of Justice. And just for listeners, uh, Advocate General Sharpstrom was challenged her removal from the Court of Justice and Brexit. The court turned down her challenge on the basis that um, it was uh, the, the, the appointment of a successor was an act of the member states uh, as sovereign states, not um, not an act of the European, uh, not acting as member states as the European Council. So the question is, does this dismissal of Advocate General Sharpstone's claim before the Court of Justice in its ex parte ruling represent a concrete example of Brexit changing EU law, both on the substantive and procedural grounds? So I don't know if you'd like, how you'd like to answer that. Thank you very much for the question. Um, I think it is exactly a concrete example of the phenomenon that I've been talking about and it connects there to the council. Um, I think although we are still waiting the final resolution of, of the litigation, I think that the in the interim order in which the Court of Justice rejected uh, the possibility of reviewing uh, the substance of the decision, for me it just doesn't fit with so many strands of EU law, including um, the fact that usually EU judicial review would examine the substance of the measure rather than the formal nature or constitution of the measure. And I think um, Brexit has not so much perhaps changed this institutional slipperiness, to put it that way, but has certainly amplified it. Uh, we could see it for the European Council with respect to the Eurozone response. We could see it um, in how the member states occasionally in, in Eurozone issues, but also if you think about, for example, the Cameron veto and treaty amendment, the member states step outside of the configuration of the institution to take decisions. And then the Court of Justice is left wondering uh, who took the decision in institutional terms. And I, th I do agree, we can see it in the uh, litigation concerning the removal of Advocate General Sharpstone as well. I think um, in pulling these examples together, what they show is that it is not clear when an institution is acting as an institution for the purposes of judicial review and when an institution's decision in my mind, an institution's decision is not an institutional decision. It is the member states. And I find this um, really difficult to pin down at the moment. And I think it is troubling that it isn't clear when we know an institution is acting and when we know that the consequences of decisions that are taken will be subject to judicial review. Thank you. That's a, could I actually just push you a bit more on that? Because I think it's a great question and a great answer. That, um, as you mentioned, Advocate General Sharpton herself said that law can't create the soul of Europe. Um, but then if you think of Luke van Middelaar's book or something, shows that the European Council is in some ways the central EU institution for many of the key decision making and Eurozone. And now if the, I'd like to know what you think of the, um, the European, in, in relation to the um, rule of law mechanism and financial penalties for Hungary and Poland, potentially. Uh, the European Council has gave basically an undertaking that that regulation would not be enforced <laughs> pending litigation in the court. And I'm wondering, how do you see that the constitutional role of the core of the European Council in the future? And that whether we have these crises like Brexit, Eurozone, slow motion crisis about the rule of law, European Council is making the big decisions, but we don't know uh, how, why in legal terms. And how, how do you see that? The, 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 what role do you see for the courts eventually? Will asserting themselves in that regard or not asserting themselves? Yeah. Um, I suppose a two part answer in a way, Ronan. Um, on the one hand, I completely agree that these examples through crisis in particular 
are showing that while we while we think about the European Council as the institution that sets the broad political development, that gives the uh, the broad outlines to the legislative institutions as to what should and should not be progressed and how it should be progressed and so on, and then the work of the detailed implementation of those broad objectives should pass to the Council European Parliament on proposals from the Commission. I think what we have seen through the uh, rule of law conditionality mechanism that you've raised that became an issue in COVID funding allocation is that the European Council has not stepped back from the regular legislative process, notwithstanding the fact that Article 15 of the treaty says that the European Council does not have, should not have a legislative role. So on the one hand, I think we have some institutional transgression because I'm not convinced that what the European Council has done or the member states to, to go back to the previous question who are not acting as an institution but collectively are taking decisions with legal implications um, we, we, we don't know in a sense what we haven't neatly divided either the institutional tasks or we haven't neatly agreed when it's legislative when it's not so I think it's a very troubling example of what you raise and the second thing I would say on that is we have excused a lot through the idea of crisis. We know that in incredibly difficult circumstances and situations demand flexibility and they demand rapidity and they demand a response that often is really difficult to progress through our established mechanisms. But I, I do wonder sometimes about conceiving everything as a crisis because it seems to let scrutiny of legal process off the hook a bit and that troubles me and we've you know we've talked about this a lot in the national context as well but I think at European Union level the same concern is there if we're willing to say well it was the eurozone crisis it had to be done this way well it was Brexit it had to be done this way well it's COVID it's you know these are incredibly challenging situations but as we enter perhaps a climate emergency this may now be the way of our current world and perhaps conceiving of everything as crisis is disturbing the balance of legal scrutiny that should be in place. So it's not to be against flexibility and rapidity given the scale of the challenges, but I think we are losing something valuable and important by not being more um, rigorous in our review. And even as I mentioned, you know, the European Parliament has to go through 1500 pages and they've had weeks, weeks to do it. Yeah. I mean, that's a great point. I mean, I probably COVID has taught us that many of the things we talked of as crises don't look so, don't look so important now uh, in retrospect. And that this constant perception of crisis, do you think that's infected the court then too? And that I, from your talk, I took a kind of critique of that the, 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 the um, importance of achieving an orderly Brexit, which might have been thought of as a thing, a kind of guidance to the political institutions, very much infected the interpretation of the court in White Man or in the RO case, where they kind of seem to give more mutual trust to a non-member state than a member state. Um, would you say that the court has been infected by that then, uh, to some degree too, it's not just the council? I think the RO judgment is a very good example of something that it just doesn't make sense in terms of how the court speaks of connections to national law, in terms of how the court dismisses the relevance of the preliminary ruling mechanism, you know, it just doesn't make sense with the rest of the case law. And I think it it is perhaps inevitable that the court is influenced, or at least aware of the deep political uncertainties surrounding the timing of the delivery of the judgments. I think in a way we see in the IN ruling a correction of RO in some respects, but then how do we make sense of RO and IN together where, you know, crucial issues like the EEA agreement, the Schengen Aki, uh, these seem to be really central in the reasoning in IN and they were completely, there was nothing comparable in the RO judgment with respect to the predicted relationship between the EU and the UK. So I think the court is perhaps unsettled. Um, at present, I think Whiteman in some ways was an incredibly confident judgment of the court about the EU legal order, but I'm not sure if, you know, if we think about um, 
I mentioned the, the, the statement that was issued with regard to the EU and Turkey in the context of migration, and this was found um, not to be a measure that could trigger judicial review. This, I'm not sure that the, the court has had time to reflect on, on the joining off of these different examples because they don't make sense looked at together. And, and that is, I think, troubling. Um, so I could just one, uh, oh, there's two questions just coming up now, but um, I said one question about citizenship, just brief, very uh, briefly, and then I'll go to the, the last two, two questions. I sense that you felt that as someone who's a real expert in a lot of aspects of EU citizenship, the uh, what struck a lot of people in the process was that there was little thought or little weight given the fact that 60 million EU citizens were just losing their citizenship, full stop. And the court has had this rhetoric about it becoming the fundamental status, and but it just went. And um, do you think there was any other way that the court could have approached the, that, or that was there any third way, any kind of anything other than absolute removal of citizens' rights? It's it's a really difficult question because on the one hand, for me, union citizenship is meaningful and it is legally meaningful. On the other hand, Article 50, which allows a withdrawal, is part of the treaties. And Article 50 makes no reference at all to citizens of the union. It, you know, Article 50 has an inbuilt cliff edge possibility after two years. So there is no provision made, even in the most extreme hard Brexit, for example, that was possible under Article 50, there is no protection in the treaties, specifically in the Article 50 context for citizens. Um, because citizenship is constructed as dependent on member state nationality, it becomes difficult for me to conceive of citizenship without nationality. What I would say, though, is that it's not so much the court, but the political institutions of the European Union that could, in my view, have done an awful lot more to value and protect citizenship as a status, but much more importantly, citizens as individuals. There were, you know, the, the reciprocal political negotiations, there could have been a unilateral guarantee issued on from the union institutions that there is nothing that would have stopped that. Um, they could have proposed legislation on protecting future free movement rights. Um, they, that, that doesn't exist for UK nationals. So there's a lot more that the political institutions, I think, of the union could have done and should have done for citizens. But I'm not sure the status of citizenship itself in how it's conceived in the treaties and in the fact that it's not given special reference in Article 50 could have persisted past membership of the union but much more could have been done for citizens that's a great point yeah the, the political choice was very much unity of the 27 brexit must cost and little weight i guess given as you think to to citizens so it's, that's a really good way of looking at it so i've got i'm going to try and put the last three questions together if you don't mind they're from abby uh, gray gray moore and susan hutchins abby gray moore says with the increasingly blurred lines between the role of the european council and the member states uh, what do you think needs to be done in order to uphold the EU's core values? And Susan Hutchins asks, what I think is a, um, a related question, which is, would you say the EU Council are almost acting in the same way as the royal prerogative is sometimes used in the UK, almost kind of unreviewable powers? Uh, so that's one question. And then Rubina asks the kind of sign-off question, which you can say what you want is, what's the main message you'd like your listeners to take away from this? And before I hand over to you to kind of Ask, answer these questions. I'd just like to say that you've had great compliments as well for in the questions for, from the audience for what really has been an exceptional, the uh, insightful talk. So thank you very much. Thank you, and, and thank you to everyone who's listened. It's hard when you <laughs> when I know you're there and I can't I cannot see you. Um, I think it's it's an interesting analogy between the European Council and the Royal Prerogative. I hadn't thought about that. So that's certainly something I'm going to take away as one of my main messages from uh, from the discussion. Um, I, I think it is, it, is, it is a very interesting point of development in EU law and EU institutional law as to what we do next about the questions linking the European Council issue together. Um, if the court continues along the line it has done around the Sharpston case and also the Turkey case in excusing these 
slightly atypical formations or convenings, um, whether it's the European Council or the Council, I think we have a problem. I think we have a problem of compliance with Article 15 of the Treaty with, with EU primary law. Um, I'm, I'm not comfortable with an, ex, an institution that is excluded from legislative functions having the highest legislative influence. I, I find this really problematic. Um, there is an institutional system of checks and balances created through the legislative process. The European Council can set the broad agenda, but then the legislative process provided for in the treaties with the balance provided for in that system should take over. So whether that's um, an alignment with world prerogative or not, I'm not sure, but I think we are at a critical point. Um, and it, it connects to the other um, issue raised about preserving union values and rule of law how can the european union aim to project and preserve rule of law values in its member states or beyond the boundaries of the eu if we have these issues within the legal order of the european union i'm not comparing the level but i am saying that they are connected to rule of law questions as for the main message um, I would say that in some ways I set myself an impossible question for the lecture by asking has EU law changed because there's an easy answer which is yes it has. What I cannot yet answer is how long that will persist and sustain. So yes it has changed and I think I'm maybe issuing myself a wake-up call to scrutinize what is happening more than observing what is happening and not using the um the idea of crisis as a sufficient justification that's a great note to end on i'd like to thank uh, professor nikhuivna for a really brilliant talk and kat balgun for a fantastic organization and you for your questions and hand you over to dr silvia shuteu to say Goodbye. Thank you very much, uh, Ronan. Thank you, Neve, for what was a wonderful lecture and much appreciated by, by all, I'm sure, despite the faceless uh, crowd. Um, thank you to everyone for uh, spending a bit of your evening tonight with us. There will be a recording of this lecture for, for you all, as well as um, an article coming from uh, sort of translating the, the lecture into written thoughts in due course. Thank you once again, and we look forward to having you over for a future Currently Good Problems lecture. Bye.